Hello everyone, we are now live. Um, I'm happy you can join me here today with the addictive brain. Um, I see coffee bagels here. Hi, thank you for coming. I would like to first start by thanking the um, addictive brain for this initiative, wonderful initiative of having live questions. Um, to discuss several different topics of science and um, I also want to thank all of you for being here today taking time on a Saturday wherever you are in the globe um, to discuss the topic of diabetic foot ulcers and wound healing so before we get started and just as people are joining in I I think I would um, just briefly introduce myself. My name is Anna, um, Anna Telechea. I am currently a postdoc at um, New York University School of Medicine and I'm studying uh, wound healing and also cancer biology. And uh, for the past 10 years, <laughs> um, I've been um, studying wound healing um, with particular focus in diabetes. Um, so this is something that interests me very much, um, as you may understand, for having studied it for so long. Um, we see that, uh, I can see that the addictive photographer is here. Hi, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for coming um, on a Saturday to join me here. Um, so, as I was saying, I was just briefly introducing myself. Um, my name is Ana. I'm originally from Portugal. I've moved to the United States in 2010 to do my PhD research. And um, I'm currently doing a postdoc. And I've been studying this uh, topic of um, wound healing, in particular in diabetes, for several years now. Um, so, I think we have some people here already with us. Uh, Mohamed, thank you for joining. Hi. <laughs> uh, always nice to see um, people joining. Um, so, I guess, um, you know, we can get started. Um, so, first of all, I would like to just briefly introduce the topic of diabetic foot ulcers. So what are diabetic foot ulcers? Um, diabetic foot ulcers are chronic wounds and a chronic wound simply means a wound that doesn't heal, doesn't heal normally. Um, many times chronic wounds get uh, stalled, they get stuck in this inflammatory process and they cannot progress. So in normal acute wound healing in healthy individuals, there are several overlapping but orderly sequential uh, phases of wound healing, uh, with the first one being um, coagulation hemostasis and um, inflammation. So oftentimes um, chronic wounds get stuck in this inflammatory process and they cannot proceed in a linear manner um, towards the next phases of wound healing, which are proliferation and uh, remodeling or maturation of the wound. Um, so diabetic foot ulcers are just an example of these chronic wounds. There can be several different types of chronic wounds, but today we're just gonna talk about diabetic foot ulcers. And um, I see a lot of people joining. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, so just to give you some numbers, some statistics, um, I would start by um, giving the numbers of just the global prevalence of diabetes in general, not diabetic foot ulcers, but diabetes. So worldwide, um, diabetes is affecting now um, approximately 8.5% of the entire world population. 
and this number has been rising exponentially. So these are the, the last numbers um, that I had access to, but it keeps rising. And um, in the US alone, um, it's about 30 million people affected by diabetes, which corresponds to approximately 9.4% of the population. So this is really a serious problem. It affects many people, as you know, and um, one of the most severe and debilitating complications of diabetes is um, diabetic foot ulcers. So what are these diabetic foot ulcers and how are they different from regular wounds? Um, so as the name suggests, um, diabetic foot ulcers occur in diabetic patients and they occur on their feet. So um, these are, as I said before, wounds that do not heal or heal very poorly and very slowly, do not heal in a normal fashion. And they tend to um, start in um, the toes or plantar um, part of the feet. And the reason why they are in the foot is because it's a lower extremity wound, because there is a lot of pressure um, in the lower extremities, because the entire weight of your body is on this, um, is on your feet. So oftentimes what happens is that there is trauma to the foot and the patient does not realize. And um, on top of that, there's poor wound healing. And so an ulcer develops and um, eventually fails to heal or fails to heal in a timely fashion, as I was saying. Um, so I guess I would start um, with some of the questions that I got. And um, I would like to start with um, this question, which was kind of coming along with uh, the same topic that I was talking about right now, which is why does diabetes impair wound healing? So there are several reasons why diabetes um, contributes to this delayed impaired wound healing. So. Um, most of them um, have to do with complications of diabetes that happen with time. Um, with once someone is diagnosed with diabetes, if they are not properly treated and monitored, and even when they are, sometimes they still develop these complications, which include neuropathy. So neuropathy is basically characterized by progressive loss of the sensation in the nerves. So that's what leads you not to feel pain or to have less sensation. And this starts um, again affecting the extremities. So if there's a trauma and um, the patients do not feel the pain, they don't pay too much attention to it and let it develop to a full wound. Um, then on top of um, this neuropathy, which is called peripheral neuropathy, um, there's also um, vascular complications. So peripheral vascular disease also occurs with diabetes a long time. And this simply means poor circulation of your um, blood. So there's not enough blood flow and especially to the extremities. So this again um, doesn't bring the oxygen and nutrients to the cells and also um, impairs wound healing. Um, on top of that, there's um, inflammation, like a baseline chronic uh, pro-inflammatory environment in diabetes. And this leads to problems in um, the immune cell function. And um, just the sustained hyperglycemia which is just prolonged high blood um, sugar levels, is um, causing as well this um, impairment in wound healing. So just to recap, the sustained high blood, high blood sugar in the body 
um, the pro-inflammatory environment that happens in diabetes, which is metabolic disease, so your inflammation is, um, is up. Um, the vascular disease that affects blood flow and neuropathy that affects the nerves and therefore affects sensation. So all these problems um, lead to an alteration on your immune and inflammatory cells. Um, so they, they start being dysfunctional and they don't respond well to the injury. And then also the endothelial cells and the blood cells um, do not respond properly, so there's no um, neovascularization, which simply means, you know, when there's a cut, when there's a wound, your blood vessels are ruptured, and um, if there's no new vasculature, um, or if it's deficient, it will also help, uh, it will also impair, sorry, um, the wound healing process. So that was one of the first questions that I had. Um, and um, I think I, I gave you pretty much an overall of the um, aspects that contribute to um, wound healing. One thing that it's important to say is that um, because of this altered immune cell function, um, the wounds are also more prone to infection. So a lot of times these diabetic foot ulcers create biofilms. So a biofilm is just uh, like bacterial film that forms um, covering these wounds and um, make them even harder to heal. It takes even longer to heal. And um, oftentimes, um, you know, these infections can, can spread and it can become really bad. <laughs> and um, speaking of which, that leads me to one of the second questions that I received. Um, one of the next questions I received, which was to differentiate between gangrene and uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Um, so gangrene is just um, characterized by tissue death and de decomposition in a certain part of your body. So it's localized uh, tissue death and decomposition. And this is mostly caused by um, insufficient blood flow. And um, so there's lack of blood su supply and uh, the tissue um, starts dying pretty much because it doesn't receive um, blood or oxygen or nutrients. Um, so it starts um, deteriorating and um, goes through a process of necrosis and um, eventually um, degrades just, just decomposition of the tissue. So this can lead to amputations and it's really terrible. And although this is localized and it's also more prone to happen in the lower extremities, um, like the toes and, and the lower limbs, it also occurs in the upper extremities, your fingers and your upper limbs. And it can also occur in other parts of the body. Um, it can affect you know, muscle and different parts. And um, typically there's, there's some big trauma, um, like a war, war wound or something, and um, you know, there's no, not enough blood supply, so the area becomes hypoxic, doesn't get oxygen, and ends up dying. And uh, how is this different from a diabetic foot ulcer? Well, first of all, gangrene um, is not exclusive to um, diabetic patients, so a diabetic foot ulcer unfortunately can complicate enough um, that it will cause gangrene as well and uh, it may lead to amputation. Um, but um, gangrene is this process that um, involves tissue death and decomposition and is not necessarily uh, tied to diabetes. Um, so I hope that <laughs> I helped uh, clarifying that. So also the diabetic foot ulcer is obvious affects the feet and uh, the gangrene can affect other parts of your body, although there's more propension to the extremities as I mentioned before. Um, so I see a lot of people joining later. Hello, thank you for coming on a Saturday, spending some time here. I would love to hear um, your comments and questions if you have any. Um, if not, I will move to one of the next questions I had 
uh, from earlier. Some of you left already questions since yesterday for me to answer today. Um, so this is an interesting question. It's more of a personal question, I feel. <laughs> um, well, professional, but <laughs> more related to me than to the topic, which is uh, why did I decide to study diabetic foot ulcers? Um, so this is a really interesting question. I think um, part of it was was just um, serendipity. I I found um, a mentor in the project um, that really excited me. I was actually uh, presented with two different um, big themes within diabetes. <clears throat> One of them would be um, immunosuppressors in metabolism and diabetes and how um, this relationship occurs. So a more of a um, metabolic approach and have having to do with um, tissue rejection and immunosuppression and how this affects um, the metabolism, the hormones and growth factors. And the other one was the diabetic foot ulcers. And um, I've always been fascinated by skin. Skin is our, the most, <laughs> the largest organ in our body and it's very complex and very interesting to me. And um, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, diabetic wound healing is um, severely compromised and it's a very complex multifactorial process so that was a big challenge that um, also excited me and um, despite being a terrible problem that affects so many people as I said earlier um, worldwide there's about 8.5 percent of the population with diabetes and in the US alone is is higher even it's about 9.4 and uh, from this 30 million people um, in the US and 8.5% uh, of the population in general in the world it's estimated that about 25% of them will develop a foot ulcer during their lifetime um, so this is actually a big um, percentage and um, not only that it's a terrible complication that really impairs the quality of life of the patients. Because as you can imagine, oftentimes it results in uh, prolonged hospitalizations and recurring hospitalizations. It requires a lot of monitoring and care. And um, it actually, there are statistics that say that 25 to 50 percent of the costs involved in diabetes care uh, go um, specifically to diabetic foot ulcer management. So that's huge. It's, uh, it's not only terrible for the patients, it's also a huge economic burden. However, despite all these efforts throughout the years from several researchers, researchers and physicians to tackle this problem, um, there's really very limited uh, options, um, commercially available options for the treatment of these wounds and um, the few that the, that exist um, oftentimes are uh, not are not effective so they the response rate varies immensely from patient to patient and so there's really no good treatment uh, for diabetic foot ulcers so this is what in uh, biomedical science we call an unmet clinical need or unmet medical need, which means it's a serious problem that affects um, the health of the patients. It's, it's a big healthcare problem. Uh, however, there's no real solution. So it, we need to keep working on this the best we can to try to find um, new treatments and different ways to, to tackle the problem and, and hopefully help manage these wounds and eventually even heal them. That's obviously the goal. So thank you for that question. That was very interesting. Katerina had that question, so thank you for that. Um, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> if you have um, any follow-up questions, I'm, I'm happy to hear. I see a lot of you there. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be here. I didn't expect so many people to join but it's great to see you all there.
I don't know if I missed some comments. Um, well, I think there's there's a, a, a question actually for our moderators, which is um, <laughs> how to become um, addicted to studies. <laughs> I don't know if this is uh, if, it, if it, this question is directed to me. Um, it's not uh, very specific to the topic, but I'm, I'm happy to, to give my own opinion. I think if you choose a field of study that you're genuinely curious and passionate about, um, it's very easy to become addicted <laughs> to it. And um, as you learn more, you'll likely find it uh, more fascinating and interesting and will um, be addicted in that way. Um, I don't think I'm addicted to a particular study per se, a study field per se, um, but um, I think I must admit I'm addicted to learning. <laughs> I'm always trying to learn new things and uh, pursue new challenges and I think um, it's, it's great to just be exposed to different topics and uh, learn more about them and maybe that's another approach if you try um, you know if you try to learn a little bit of about different topics in in science um, you can likely identify uh, some that you prefer that you like the most um, and then go through that path and see where it takes you <laughs> as I said earlier I'm, I'm still studying uh, wound healing and tissue regeneration but I'm also studying cancer now and um, I'm very interested in other topics as well including neuroscience and drug delivery um, I did um, pharmacy before my PhD so I did a lot of um, nanotechnology and microtechnology before and that's also very interesting to me and um, you know I think <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Um, I think it's definitely um, an, an interesting question, <laughs> but I may not be the best one to answer it. So just checking the comments. Yeah, I think that was the only question live. However, I did, ha I did get a few other questions from earlier. So one of them was a really good question, which was um, if type 2 diabetes um, leads to more of these um, ulcers that do not heal compared to type 1 if there are differences in type 1 versus two diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And um, there's, there are several differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, however, when it comes to the development of this, this particular complication, um, studies have shown that there are no differences, there's not um, a higher prevalence um, in developing these ulcers if you suffer from type 1 or type 2 diabetes. That being said, the majority of the population nowadays um, suffers from type 2 diabetes, which is related to insulin resistance um, versus insulin deficiency, which was one of the first differentiators between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In the past they called it insulin dependent to type 1 versus insulin independent to type 2. Um, now those definitions have been updated since oftentimes um, with time as the disease progresses the resistance of the cells to insulin um, eventually uh, leads to insulin depletion as well and uh, the patients need not only this anti-diabetic um, oral uh, medications so anti-diabetic pills but they also need um, insulin on top of that um, also typically um, type 1 diabetes was um, affecting people from very young age and uh, versus type 2, which was affecting mostly um, adults, people over um, 18 years old or even later. 
and uh, nowadays you see already children with type 2 diabetes and this has to do with changes in lifestyle and diet um, obesity is you, as you all probably know is one of the main risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes so um, those differences are are still um, the differences between type 1 and, and type 2 diabetes are still true they they still diagnose them that way however there's um, not such a clear cutoff as it was before as um, a lot of these genetic and environmental factors are are coming together and playing a role um, but um, in terms of developing these ulcers there has been shown no difference in the prevalence between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, there ha also has not been shown that, um, at least to the best of my knowledge, that there's no difference in gender. So whether you're male or female, um, if you have diabetes, your risk of de developing a foot ulcer is uh, roughly the same. Um, interestingly enough, though, um, if you're taller <laughs> and if you're heavier, you're more likely to develop an ulcer and this has to do again with the pressure of your body being applied um, to, the, um, to the feet and um, causing this um, problem to... sorry, I was just checking the time. Um, <laughs> and causing this problem to um, become uh, more at, they become more at risk of developing this problem, I should say. Sorry, I got a little bit distracted because I was just trying to check the time. Um, I think that um, these sessions typically last about 25 minutes to half an hour. So I don't know if you have any more questions for me. Don't be shy. It's last chance. <laughs> I think you can always uh, follow up later with comments and questions as well. But um, we still have a few more minutes, so if you'd like to ask something, now it's a good time. Oh, so um, another question was that um, what, how do you study um, di diabetic foot ulcers in, in the lab? Um, so there's several different ways of studying this and different groups have different research approaches to study diabetic foot ulcers. Um, some people are fortunate enough to work directly with patients and have um, patient samples available to analyze um, at the molecular level and maybe discover some abnormalities at the cellular and molecular level that may be good targets for new therapies and diagnosis. Um, others um, have used different animal models to study um, diabetes and diabetic foot ulcers. And um, there's also just studies in um, cells. So either cells that are primary cells that are isolated from um, fresh tissue or um, the cell lines that are immortalized and commercially available and you can study things such as um, the effects of um, hyperglycemia on these cells, uh, how they function, how their morphology, how their um, proliferation, migration, how their immune uh, functions for immune cells, whether they produce more or less inflammatory markers, whether they are able to, for instance, for endothelial cells, whether they are able to form these new vascular structures or not. So there's several different ways that you can study um, diabetic foot ulcers um, in a lab setting for research. Of course, if you're not working with the actual patients on a clinical trial setting in a clinical study um, it's you need to keep in mind that not all these results are going to be translated to the patients the same way 
So ideally you'll have several different models to study. And then you can, if you see um, a trend, if you see that your results are replicated throughout different models, if you have a good basis to be confident about your results, um, then again, it's not <laughs> guaranteed uh, that it will work um, in, in the actual diabetic patients. And in fact, a lot of the studies uh, so far um, have been very promising in preclinical studies, but then when they reach um, the clinical study phase, they, they tend to fail. So it's something to keep in mind. But um, I think all the research that has been done so far is important and has already contributed to move forward with lots of different therapies and um, not only agents, but also devices like wound dressings and matrices. Um, now there's a lot of focus on cell therapy to help the wounds heal and um, these like skin equivalents that would replace um, the skin and, and close the gap. And also, of course, um, antibiotics and um, agents with the potential to uh, minimize the bio burden and biofilm in the wound, as I mentioned before. Um, so yeah, there's still a lot to learn, but um, I think some progress have to, has been made, definitely. There's some products in the market already that help, um, but like I said before, it's still an unmet clinical need that needs more attention and uh, hopefully more funding <laughs> so we can continue good research and um, hopefully eventually not um, not too long it won't take too long to to find an actual therapy that will help treat these wounds okay so i think we come to an end <laughs> thank you so much once again thank you to the addictive brain for having me for hosting me today and um, i look forward to um, connect with you the ones who are here today thanks again for coming i really appreciate having an audience and um, if you have any follow-up questions please let me know thank you have a good weekend take care bye bye